Do you still feel a uh, big time after meeting Andre Gray a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, that was good. Um, nice little interview with him. Oh, I mean, I've been on with TalkSport as well, so uh, oh. I'm living the life at the moment. Yeah, no, no, he was great. Uh, big time Charlie. Obviously, <laughs> obviously spoke to him for my dissertation. Uh, he was great to agree to do an interview, and Watford were great to accommodate me, so yeah, it was nice. It was nice train, nice training room, training ground, and something to brag about. Yeah, nice picture for the social media as well. It was always nice. I think we should we'll get going. With this. Yeah, I reckon so. Let's get going. We're rolling. So, um, welcome back to the UTF podcast. Uh, thank you again for all the support you've given us on the previous two uh, episodes. Um, we got a little bit to talk about today. Six Nations is coming up. Super Bowl is tonight, so it will already have happened by the time um, this goes live. Obviously, England are, as we speak, playing against Italy, Italy in the Six Nations, so um, you'll also have that result. Uh, just a quick thing before we start. Um, I did thank Marcus last week at the end of the podcast for all the work he does. Our producer, Marcus Stanley, in the booth, he's instrumental, really, with all this. Um, as much as we can do on camera, we can't do any of it unless he edits it, and um, it does so in quite a quick time and gets it out and you know the quality is great so um yeah for anyone who didn't see that last week because we left it to the end of the podcast massive thanks to marcus um show him love on the socials um and also we want to let you know about next week's podcast because uh someone's commitment is uh that's a little bit well i um <laughs> sadly i'm not around uh here next again i have to go back home to wales so um especially for you especially the wheels england game on next week in six nations so thank god i'm not in england just in case we do lose do you know what i think you've every every year since we started university you've gone home it's just when a case you played it. wales it's just it's ridiculous just you're just a coward so but either way we're gonna change up the dates aren't we when we yeah we're, we're gonna film now on wednesday and hopefully the podcast will be out on either the friday or saturday more likely the saturday at the moment depending are... on how quick max can turn it around we are hoping to have marcus come on as a guest so you can finally uh finally be the three of us um in light of um the uh second, the second city derby yeah. which is going to be up next weekend so we're going to try and get a bit of a preview going before that comes especially out especially with marcus being a birmingham fan exactly. so we can get a good insight into what a derby day is like for a birmingham fan i mean i think also the arsenal the north london derby is that it same is, weekend yeah, so yeah. we'll do a little bit of a chat on uh, on derbies in general you know which ones is because i know marcus has opinions on um which ones should not be considered derbies and which ones shouldn't and I have a lot to say about that so that's the, that's next week but anyway we'll get on with this week because you know that's why we're here um, obviously the Six Nations are on now we've had two games so far the third game which you would have already seen is being played as we speak uh, Wales I imagine you were far, you were quite happy with uh, your results so um, uh, uh, yeah I'm a very very happy man after yeah. yesterday um, it was quite a shock result really I don't think anyone expected us to dominate as much as we did um we obviously we could see the try late at the end, which was the only downfall. Because obviously we were hoping to keep them to zero, but no one expected that dominant display that we 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 shown. Thirty four seven was the final result. Um, and from one for one to fifteen, well one to twenty three, I should say actually, Wales were outstanding. Um, couldn't ask for better, especially with all the injuries we do have. It was great to see. Uh, I think the Scarlet's influence was clear, evident to see. Uh, was the... Sure, that's not your bias coming out there. No, definitely not my bias coming out there. I think it's pretty well known uh, in the rugby okay. rugby sphere. Uh, there was ten Scarlet players starting, um, and including well, the back line was, was six Scarlets, and the only person who was not a Scarlet used to be a Scarlet. So it was clearly evident in our back line how we, we wanted to play and how we executed, and you could tell everyone was used to playing with each other, which obviously helped. Uh, I imagine other... it certainly helps, yeah. If you're used to playing with your teammates, it's more cohesive, isn't it? It's a lot more. Exactly. Uh, and the, the, even the non scars players in that team were excellent. Josh Navidi at seventh. Um, obviously, Cartridge Blues, outstanding. A couple of important turnovers under the posts, which obviously helped us defensively. Um, Josh Adams had a good debut on the wing. It was just an excellent performance, all-round performance, to be honest. <clears throat> so, um, does that give you... Sort of renewed confidence going forward. We won't touch too much on the England game right yet, because we'll do that in a minute. But does that give you sort of more confidence going into the next couple of games? It does, yeah. Especially, I I hope Gatland will stick with the fifteen he chose yesterday. Um, I think they all earned their shirt, all in their place ahead of next week against England at Twickenham. Uh, I I'd be, I'd be disappointed if he does decide to make any changes. I know George North had a good game for Northampton on the weekend, coming back from injury. Um, obviously Liam <coughs> Williams could be fit to play as well, but I just don't think. You, you can drop any of those players yesterday. All all of them were outstanding. Maybe you could bring a couple onto the bench, but starting wise, I don't think I'd make any changes. Um, there's just, I mean, I'm confident now within I think growing within the Wales fans. Yeah. Um, 
because obviously no one expected us to do that yesterday and obviously with England next week if we can perform like that defend like that I think it's, we'll be quietly confident heading to Twickenham One player who um, I mean, you mentioned to me and I saw it up on social media that had a, a quite a good game um, and someone who hasn't really been that influential for the Welsh squad in quite a long time is Lee Halfpenny yeah. um, how did you make of what he did on the day? It was the best performance I've seen from Lee Halfpenny in years uh, he actually normally uh, he's normally just in the squad for his kick in but yesterday he actually added something going forward he scored two tries got 24 points overall out of the 34 um, he actually offered something going forward which is not what we're used to with him uh, recently obviously I think it helps he has moved to the Scarlets this season so he's getting used to playing in with those obviously the players he had and more of mm-hmm. an attacking display so I think that does help but yeah it's the best I've seen him play in a long time and if he continues to play like that going forward then I have no qualms with him being in the side but obviously he's got to keep he's got to keep that type of uh, performance up. Uh, what I will say though, on the other hand, is Scotland were very poor yesterday. Um, I think a lot. Your l- voice is going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, carry on. I think um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people would have thought Scotland would have been much better than what they were. Especially after their successes against Australia not too long ago. Yeah, exactly. In the old term, they were probably one of the standout sides. They beat Australia. Should have beat New Zealand uh, in a close contest with those. Um, it was just. They, they were just making too many mistakes, too many handling errors. They pack just weren't good enough yesterday. I felt so, um, John Barkley, the captain, kept getting penalised at the breakdown. He didn't adapt his style, which is disappointing for him. But, yeah, it was just a very poor performance, Scotland. They they do see, tend to have one of these performances in the Six Nations last year against England. I think they got defeated 61-17 or something similar. Uh, so they they tend to do have one of these days off. So maybe it might be a uh, kick up the backside for those mm. going going ahead. To the Certainly was a disappointing result for them. I imagine they wanted to come in and get things off to a good start, especially when they're in decent form at the moment as a nation. But obviously it's not the best. One game though that was completely different, like the very opposite. You know, yours was such a, an easy contest, such a tight contest was that of uh, Ireland and France. Yeah, that, uh, was, that was interesting. A nice way to finish the game, wasn't it? You'd probably think it was. It'd be the other way around with how both games went. Certainly would, yeah. Um, Ireland got very lucky at the end. Obviously, <clears throat> Johnny Sexton, fantastic sh- kick. Oh, so such a kick. Not not just the kick itself, but to have the, the, the confidence and it. the arrogance yeah. to do it, f- to go for that forty-five meters out. It's almost eighty-second minute, almost the eighty-third minute. Exactly. Yeah. Um, t- to knock one over like that shows he's world class. He everyone knows it. He is and it was fifteen thirteen, wasn't it? The final score. Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, obviously, a few minutes before, France did have a penalty to extend the lead, and obviously, it would end up winning on the game. Obviously, a young fly off, and Anthony Bellew missed, so it was disappointing for him. Uh, but yeah, I think Ireland got away with one there in uh, in Paris. The French team, no one knew, knew what to expect from them, and they came out with a bit of fight. It was the most entertaining of the games. It was tight knit. There's only there's only the one try, and that was a great finish by Teddy Tamar. Um, showed great pace and backed himself to to score there, uh, which was uh, uh, nearly got France over the line. Except for for Johnny Sexton's magnificent kick at the end. There was a massive talking point in the game though, which obviously mm. me and I wanted to discuss. Uh, in about the seventy fourth, seventy fifth minute, uh, a French player went down injured. It looked like it was a knee injury, but they claimed it was a head injury. So he went off for HIA, just so they could bring on the starting scrum. HIA off. for people that don't know means head injury assessment. Um, obviously, when you go off for a head injury assessment, a player can come back on, obviously, to replace them. So the starting scrum off was already substituted off for the obviously the scrum off who went down injured. So they wanted obviously to be able to bring on the national. Basically, scrum if, off. if an injury like that happens, they are entitled to bring um, someone who's already come off back on, whereas they couldn't have done that if it was any other injury. Exactly. So they seem they done a similar thing last year with Wales, against Wales, which obviously didn't go down well. Um, and obviously yesterday. It was a uproar on Twitter and in the rugby universe. Um, a lot of people branded disgraced. It was clearly not a head injury. If you look at the footage, nothing to do with his head. It's clearly a knee injury. Um, and they've done it just to gain an advantage, which is an absolute disgrace, in my opinion, and plenty of other... You think it's disgrace? Footage. You don't think it's taking advantage of... It, well, I suppose it is taking advantage of... It's bending the rules, isn't it, I suppose? It's, it's the he- HIA is there to help... Uh, to obviously defend players from head in, like serious head injuries and brain damage. I suppose so, yeah. So when you're using yeah. it to just gain a team advantage, it's obviously morally and ethically incorrect. So who was the one uh, from... Because I haven't actually seen the clip. 
<clears throat> sorry, who was the one who instigated it? Was it the player or was it the coaches? Or? That's the thing. Uh, Nigel Owens obviously was the referee in the game uh, and he told the Ireland players weren't happy with it. Uh, and obviously Nigel Owens said the doctor said it was a head injury. He's not a doctor himself, so he had to go with what the doctor Just said, yep. which obviously you can't blame Nigel at all in this situation. He had to listen to the team, obviously listen to the doctor. So I think it was part of the player, the team doctor. They were all trying to, obviously, must have had a word down from the higher, obviously, higher uh, hierarchy. So it came down to that, and obviously they decided to try and gain advantage. So I want to roll out to ask you with it regarding it. Is uh, do you feel they deserve to lose the end? Do you feel justice was made after trying to gain advantage, to try and win the game? Do you feel justice was made they lost because they tried obviously stealing stealing the thing with the HIA? Yeah, well, I'd I'd say so. I think um, when you have uh, an incident like that, it just it leaves you with a with a sour taste in your mouth, knowing that, for instance, if you, if they had if if Johnny Sexton hadn't scored in the way he did. It would have been poor to know that they gained an advantage that could have potentially helped France win. You've lost because someone's basically cheated. It's the same with diving in most sports or, you know, any kind of simulation. You don't want to be cheated out of it. You want to win properly um, or lose properly, should I say. So, um, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's good for the Irish that um, they did eventually win because, like you say, it's not fair. No one wants to see it. No one wants to see people bend the rules to gain an advantage when it goes against ethical code. It's, yeah... Um, yeah, I think it's it's probably fair. Do you feel it's something the world rugby need to look at now and uh, to obviously try and do something to prevent this happening again? Because obviously, like I said, it happened last year with the French against Wales. They seem to do something similar. Do you feel it's something the world rugby need to try and maybe be harsh definitely, on? Definitely, yeah, definitely. But the uh, the issue, issue is there, other than deterrent by giving harsh punishment, how do you prevent that during the game? I mean, like, for instance, the, uh, simulation, you can review it on cameras and whatnot. Is that what you, you think? They should maybe review the injury a bit more and go, well... But then, but if you do that, you're then um, dismissing the views of a qualified doctor. Exactly, that's, that's so the issue. That, that, that's it's the issue you have. It's how you approach it on field, other than just even if they are being ethically incorrect, you uh, it's harder to tell people you're being ethically. So you're telling a doctor. At the end of the day, if a doctor says, if a doctor says you've got a concussion or a head injury, and you say actually, no, he didn't look at the challenge. It was nowhere near his head. And then it does turn out that from some type of blunt trauma he ended up getting from that tackle even though it was nowhere near his head he got whiplash or or something along those lines if you've gone against the doctor and gone no actually look the replay doesn't show that and then he does have further complications because of the injury then you're in big trouble you're in big trouble yeah you've yeah. really got yourself in the mire it's a, t- it's a tough one I don't know how I'd, how I'd sort that out really um, yeah that's like I said it's, it's something that needs to be looked at it's something that it's hard, obviously, it's difficult, you said, it's difficult to be prevented, but something that needs to be a yeah. serious look at. Certainly does. So, England today against Italy, quick mention, as we say, is currently on um, as we speak. I'm not sure of the score at the moment, obviously, we've been busy setting all this up. Mm. Do you expect anything less than an England victory? A bonus point victory, exactly, to be fair. Don't want to don't wanna say too clearly in case, you know, Stick. we are currently <laughs> losing... 20 nil or whatever but I, I don't know you'd think England would win it's the sort of game that really if England are going to have any chance of winning the Six Nations which they certainly should do given how they've performed in the last couple of years they should certainly be going in, into the game knowing they're going to win or at least you know extremely confident that that's the only result they're going to get um, I was quite happy with the lineup, other than a couple of changes we were, I was fairly spot on with what I said um, obviously the, the, the only other changes were Courtney Laws played as flanker instead of uh, Underhill like I said I said <clears throat> and Ben Teo uh, came in as outside centre instead of Jonathan Joseph. But other than that, it was fairly similar. Um, and Dylan Hartley. But I, I thought Dylan Hartley would play, even though I would have gone Jamie George. Um, so I'm, quite, I'm quite happy with the team. Um, I think England certainly have the quality to do it, uh, the strength and depth. Um, and Eddie Jones is a good tactician. So, yeah, I think if, if England don't get a win, then it, we're going to have to ask some serious questions about what we're going to do at the rest of the Six Nations tournament. Uh, are you excited for obviously there's the big one next mm. week um, the big rivalry I'll see on you as well uh, how do you feel that one's going to go down I'm looking forward to it because other than the World Cup like, we've been quite good in Six Nations before you both years we've been you the last two years the last yeah. two years the two years I've known you so um, I'm looking forward to making it three in a row um, you know touch wood that's what we can do um, Wales don't know what it is really. Well, because Wales are a good rugby side, but just you know, maybe it's maybe it's an inferiority complex. Maybe you just can't rise to the occasion. That's not meant to slag off Welsh people, but I, you know, certain people's yes, 
So, well, certain people do have Everton have an inferiority complex because Liverpool, we just can't rise to the occasion. Maybe the Welsh have it against English. I, I don't know. But, but you say yeah. that, but we have obviously said we beat you in the World Cup. In the World Cup, but the World Cup is the biggest ball game. stage of them all. Um, ball game. And obviously, we, know, we used to beat you in Six Nations quite regularly for the last few years. Uh, so, in the last two years, really, you've started to yeah. pull away on us. Obviously, last year, we probably should have won. It's just a poor kick, and then obviously, Elliot Daly showed a great finish. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I was, obviously, you're very confident heading into it. I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, I'm quite. I, I was. I wasn't I'm, confident. I'm ninety five percent because I can't <sighs> currently see what the score is against Italy, so I I won't go with a hundred. But I'm I'm ninety five percent certain. Because like, what I'm thinking is after I, I, coming into the tournament, I obviously I don't know what to expect from Wales. We got a new look kind of side, a lot of injuries, so it's hard to be a confident heading into the Scotland game. Never mind mm-hmm. the England game. But after the way we performed yesterday. If we make no change to the team, I don't see why we can't go to Twickenham and defeat England. Uh, if we play like that, defend like that, especially, then give Scotland a sniff for 80 minutes. And when we did, we had someone like Josh Namedia to turn over or someone there to make a tackle or interception. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm quietly confident heading into Twickenham next week. Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting game. It's the big one, obviously, for yourself, for me, for every Welsh and English fan. England and the team everyone wants to beat. They probably are the team to beat in the Six Nations as well. So, well, I, I think I think as well, just in general, um, I, I don't think I'm speaking with a bias here, I'm not sure. I think in general, England versus Wales and England versus Scotland are the two biggest games anyway. The grudge match between those two countries specifically, I mean, if you play Scotland, it's not quite the same as if we play Scotland, is it? So, I'm the same with no, the same as if we play you. you. Exactly, yeah, it's this this kind of deep-seated rivalry, so I think it's a, it should be a good one, and I'm looking forward to watching it. Yeah, I, I literally can't wait next week, and hopefully by the time we film, uh, obviously not the next podcast we've got that week, hopefully the one after, well, one of us will be coming back happy, and one of us <laughs> will obviously be upset, and hoping the upset one is going to be you. I don't think so. <laughs> um, obviously, that's pretty much what we've got to say about the Six Nations so far in the rugby. Um, moving on to football now. Six Nations will probably be the sort of number one topic for the next yeah, couple of weeks. Yeah, as it is with... Obviously, as you'd expect. But, you know, with the end of the transfer window of football, we do have a couple of things we can touch on, so I thought we'd have a little chat about that. Um, yeah, obviously, we talked last week uh, on the on the last podcast about how, how um, obviously, new sign-ins, what we made of them, especially Everton United. Potential uh, ones we saw coming up. Yeah, potential ones. So what I want, we want to discuss today is, obviously, how the new sign-ins went on the weekend. There may be any new signs that happened after, obviously, we finished the podcast, heading into deadline day. And just see how they were at the weekend. Um, I think the best one to start with, because I think you have a lot to say on this one, is obviously Mkhitaryan and Aubameyang. Obviously, both signing for Arsenal. Mm-hmm. And first game together yesterday seemed to go down pretty well. Mm-hmm. 5-1 against, yeah, obviously, your did. beloved Everton. Mkhitaryan, three assists. Aubameyang, debut goal. And obviously a Welshman, Aaron Ramsey, with a hat-trick. Not a very good day at the office for you, was it? Yeah, it was a tough one to take, I'll be honest. <laughs> it, wasn't a, it wasn't one of my most enjoyable days watching Everton play uh, there's an awful lot I'd like to say which probably is not the most PC so I'll <laughs> keep it to myself but um, I think uh, I think Arsenal played well against uh, Everton but I don't want to give them too much credit because it was all Everton's undoing Everton were defensively a shambles uh, for, a, for a side that apparently according to Sam Allardyce can't defend um, we set up to be one of the most it's probably the most defensive side I've ever seen um, as an Everton supporter, five at the back, two defensive midfielders, that's seven defensive players with three uh, isolated attackers, um, non-existent midfield really, couldn't battle Arsenal, so Arsenal were through every single time, um, Ilya Kim Mangala, um, or Mangala, I don't know how you pronounce it properly yet, um, it's probably one of the worst debuts I've ever seen, Francisco Jr. for a, cu- a couple of years ago, Against Leeds United in the in the, uh, in the cup was atrocious. Was hooked at half time. The only reason Mangala wasn't hooked at half time was because Allardyce is a moron. That's that's <laughs> the only reason he was absolutely atrocious. I think uh, the system was was poor. Um, thankfully, we got a goal back with Dominic Calvert Lewin come on, uh, but the substitution was awful because it, he come on for Theo Walcott, the only player who put in any effort, who ran you know his team, who ran ran himself into the ground, and then Allardyce has the uh, has the audacity to come out and criticise the players. Um, and you know he's just he's just he's just dreadful. I'm, I've had enough. I want I want him gone. 
Adam Ola Lookman going out on loan on deadline day was the um, straw that broke the camel's back for me. Especially grabbing a winner as well. Oh, you, just, you, you don't know. Uh, you don't understand. It, it, I, <laughs> I lost my mind when I saw him he'd gone to RB Leipzig, uh, Leipzig, sorry, in um, in the German Bundesliga. Obviously scored the winner against Borussia Mönchengladbach this weekend. Uh, whilst we're stuck with Yannick Bellassi tripping over the ball, so it, yeah, it's great. There's nothing better than seeing Adam Ola Lookman beat two defenders and slot in the bottom left corner when we've got Yannick Bellassi who does a step over, looks up, picks out uh, no one in the box, puts it in anyway, can't clear the first man. There's nothing worse than that. And uh, I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to this season just finishing, getting out of the way. But um, I had lost interest by this point, so it's not a massive deal. But I think uh, Aubameyang was lucky to have his go. It's, it was an embarrassing, embarrassing decision. It was so far offside, it was ridiculous. Um, Sometimes you get marginal ones where you think, yeah, that probably is offside, but I understand why they've given it. That was awful. I don't know how the linesman got away with that. Um, but yeah, you know, Mkhitaryan and Aubameyang obviously striking up the same partnership they had, Borussia Dortmund, and it really works for them. Um, uh, well, just It's a shame it happened to be against us for the first game. <laughs> let's, if we want to see more of a cut front in, let's hope Everton keep losing, and uh, we get to see more of that, mm. which is obviously quite funny to watch. That was actually quite to- surprisingly subdued because... Uh, <laughs> When the game was on, it was it was it was an awful lot louder. It was uh it was not good. It was not yeah it wasn't it wasn't a fun day. I didn't enjoy yesterday at all. Obviously, another signing you have got oh. and um, Aldis already seemed to well he's put him on the bench. Toss uh toss him. Why 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 do you think Aldis has dropped him already after only two games? Oh God knows, God knows what's going on inside <laughs> that man's brain. He says uh, in his press conference this week that. Uh, Dominic Calvert-Lewin, Umani Ass, and uh, Cenk Tosin, all three have not been able, been able to nail down a number one spot yet. They haven't impressed enough to nail down a number one spot. Tosin's had two games. He's had two games coming from Turkey. I'm starting to get it right. I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's had two games coming from, from Turkey. Um, he hasn't played the full 90 in either. I, I don't quite know what kind of Houdini he expects to have signed from Turkey for £27 million, who's going to come in and be a magician and just a you know, score goals for fun. Dominic Calvert-Lewin is obviously 20, 21 years old. He's not experienced enough to carry the line. And Umani Ass has missed three chances in the last two games that I could have scored and I can't play football. So I don't understand um, why we're in this this predicament. I mean, we had a flurry of Besiktas fans that support started to support Everton because they're enamoured by Cenk Tosin. Even they've turned on the club. That's how ridiculous we've got to the point with some analysis selection. So, um, at this moment in time, I'd be concerned if I was Cenk Tosin, thinking, what have I signed on to? Because it's just, it, it's such a stagnant project and we had so many different ideas and you think the amount of money, we spent 50 million in January alone, we spent 150 million in the summer, we spent so much money to be dreadful, to be a dreadful team. Um, but when I learned and left, I didn't think he, he thought he'd be going to a higher Premier League team. And getting more minutes. <laughs> and getting more minutes. And getting so. more minutes. You know, fair play to that. I, I, I love Aaron Lennon and I hope he does really well, but... um. In all fairness, Theo Walcott, like I said, was the one shining light in that game. He did play exceptionally well. Um, he was unlucky not to get a goal, uh, and I think it was extremely harsh that he was withdrawn after an hour. Um, maybe it's because he wanted to be uh, Sam Allardyce wanted to bring him off before he ran before he ran himself, you know, to death. Um, maybe he wanted to rest him for um, for the next game. So but... Obviously, the game was gone by that stage. So. Yeah, exactly. But you know, it, 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 it's su- it's such a gut punch when the only player that's actually playing any wo- any good. Is taken off because you think, well, what's the point now? Then you're basically accepting defeat, which obviously we know as fans it's a defeat. But you should never give up in a game, or at least in my in my opinion, you should never give up because you never know. Arsenal four 0 up when they drew four 0 with Newcastle. You have no idea that the game's actually over. Um, but that's such a negative substitution that it's basically like uh, conceding defeat, and I, I just can't accept that. So you want Big Sam gone ASAP or mm, yeah, in the summer? Yeah, um, it, it's strange. He's angered me more than I thought it would because <laughs> I think initially he had he didn't do a single thing wrong on the pitch. I thought he was faultless um, on and off the pitch. His attitude was fantastic. Um, and Roberto Martinez, I was fed up with because of his on-pitch antics. Um, Ronald Koeman was the same. Allardyce just is across the board is 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 really grinding my gears. Um, he, he said this week uh, someone. Up, after the game, someone asked him, did he regret sending out Adam Ola Lookman on loan? And he said, no, because I have Yannick Bellassi, who costs 25 million, and Theo Walcott, who costs, costs 25 million, who costs 20 million. I have the um, I have the experience. So you're basically saying, because you cost a lot of money, you're only good. I don't care how much you cost. 11 million for Adam Ola Lookman was a steal. He's fantastic. He's got such an, 
an important energy and he's so good for us he, he was fantastic when he came on, against, came on against Liverpool in the cup I just I I can't I can't cope and I, I really hope that I don't care who we replace him with there's um a couple of names like uh, Lucien Favre um Paolo Fonseca obviously Marco Silva who's now unemployed um though a lot of managers I'd like to come in the summer but I definitely definitely want to see Sam Allardyce have his contract cut short when the uh, when the season ends because we need because it's not going to move us forward at the end of the day it's not going to bring I guess the biggest kick in the teeth with the Luckman thing was they did go and score the win obviously on his David yeah. Phillips so he was more fair uh, play to him because at the end of the day if he can come back as a as a better all rounded player because he's had more minutes under his belt then great but my genuine worry is that he will come back to a different club because he hasn't been shown the respect he should have been at Everton there was links um, he's been linked with Tottenham almost all the whole season because Tottenham is someone um, who are interested in his ability and we haven't been giving him the game time we should have and my worst fear is that we'll lose him to someone like that because he is a genuine exciting talent and I want him to play more um, and it, it, it's 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 frustrating when players play poorly but it's even more frustrating when the players that are playing well aren't given the game time they deserve because you think well what's the point you're basically accepting we're going to lose now we're playing players out of position but anyway we'll stop talking about Everton too, Everton too much because I, I could genuinely go on for an entire podcast about the things wrong with that club um, obviously your big money signing or not big money yeah. signing but well, big profile yeah. signing scored um, scored on his on his it's Old Trafford debut big debut Old Trafford debut so, yeah it was, um, got a bit lucky obviously he missed the penalty um, but he luckily scored the rebound so that's obviously good news for him to get off you know get, get on the board nice and early get a goal um, it's good for the confidence okay, just exactly. to you know get, um, get started it was, a, it, was a, it was a victory we needed after midweek. Obviously, probably the worst we've played under Mourinho against Spurs. Awful. We offered nothing. I even dropped Pogba for the game, yes, uh, for the game yesterday. Yeah, for uh, which was a bit of a shock. But obviously, Pogba came on and did play well when he came on yesterday. Um, good to see Lukaku back on the score sheet. Obviously, great to see Sanchez on the score sheet as well. So it was just a good, comfortable 2 0 win, really. Another clean sheet, as, as we've done most of the season. I think we lost 15 now this season. Um, I think it's the most in the league. So it. It was just a comfortable victory over Huddersfield. Obviously, they they did beat us early in the season, so it's good to obviously not give them a chance this time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it especially was... I mean games like that. If you're looking to get back to where you used to be, where you were challenging for league titles, they're the games you have to win anyway. It should be exactly simple wins. Uh, so it was just it was just nice to, to get like a straightforward victory and not mm-hmm. have any issues or worries, especially after midweek. Yeah. So like I said the Tottenham game, as you feel now by Everton yesterday, that's how I was feeling on a. Uh, Obviously, after the Spurs mm. game, so luckily we didn't do a podcast uh, on Wednesday yeah. Thursday, to be honest. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was just great to see us come back and obviously bounce back with a good, confident and obviously nice two 0 victory. Um, obviously hoping going to we can carry that form now into the next few weeks. I think the league title is gone now. Obviously, I know City City only drew with Burnley yesterday, but. It's not coming back now. But if we can just finish second, to be a decent season. I think try that's what, what's you know the most likely. So yeah, try to finish second, maybe win one of the other trophies, and obviously next season we'll hopefully challenge a bit better for the title. Just with a few other uh, signings, that obviously there are there are so many we won't talk about all of them. Um, this deadline day alone, Premier League clubs are involved in countless amount of deals. There's a couple that really interest me. I don't know what interests you. I want to see what your opinion of it is. Daniel Sturridge to West Brom. That was done a couple of yeah. days before the deadline day. What do you think about that one? I think that's a great deal for both West Brom and for Sturridge himself. Obviously, he's not really getting a look in at Liverpool at the moment. Klopp uh, obviously prefers others in his position. Well, even Danny Ings is ahead of him in the packing order exactly. now. Exactly. So, um, and obviously, so he needed to go out and get game time, especially with, the world, with it being a World Cup year. He obviously, he wants to make the England squad. And everyone knows Sturridge is a class player on his day. Um, he's shown that in the past. His injuries have obviously stopped his career from progressing, um, obviously, as much as it should have. But I think Sturridge is one of those players that West Brom... You could, you could save West Brom from the drop. Obviously, they did lose on the game, which we'll touch on in a bit. But he's someone who... He, he could get goals for them, especially if he gets service. Um, so I think it's a good thing for them. Obviously, he chose West Brom over Newcastle for family reasons. Obviously, he's from the Midlands himself. Mm-hmm. His family are there. That's why he chose them over, over Newcastle. But I feel like Sturridge is um, a good deal for West Brom, good deal for him. And I think it's just good all around. I'm not sure what, do you agree? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think it's um, it's a good move. For him, because uh, well, I mean, it's an it's an interesting move to me because Daniel Sturridge obviously has um, pace and power and, and height and strength, but um, with West Brom already having Salomon Rondon, who's really starting to find his kind of his own in this in this team, even if he's not scoring every single week, he's he's quite an influence for this team. He was fantastic when he played uh, Everton, for example. Um, I think it's strange um, that Sturridge is the type of striker they've gone for. 
<clears throat> that being said, whenever he's wherever he's been, um, Chelsea, Man City, his loan spell with Bolton, Liverpool, he's always scored goals. Um, West Brom need goals when the relegations are at the bottom of the table at the moment. Um, and also, um, importantly for him, the World Cup's coming around the corner, and at the moment you have the likes of Harry. Obviously, Harry Kane's going to be there, um, but Jamie Vardy and Danny Welbeck and all these other people will be vying for a spot. Um, and he needs to prove that he deserves to be there because at the moment he doesn't deserve to be there on merit alone. So, um, yeah, I think I think it was a good move because, you know, you'd think he'd be motivated and obviously West Brom want to get the best out of him. Um, did you see much of the weekend, of how he performed at the weekend? Because obviously I think, I did. they lost against Southampton, didn't they, West Brom? Yeah, they did. Which we'll um, touch more on we'll a little bit with the managers, yeah. but, um, yeah, I don't know how he got I, on. I, I know he started with, obviously, he went for a different type of formation, Party did. Uh, they went for a 4-4-2, which they normally just play one up top. They did have Sturridge and Rondon both playing. I didn't get to see much of that game, obviously. It wasn't on TV or anything, so it was difficult to see mm-hmm. much of it. Um, so I, I didn't get to see much of it. Obviously, I'll probably try my highlights when I can. Um, and obviously, I get to see in the next few weeks how he does go. Um, so obviously, like I said, he's a class player. He's someone England. He can get back to his best, yeah. Then obviously, he'd be perfect for England ahead of the World Cup if he could get back to his best. But it's hard to see that at the moment. So pe- so it all depends how fit he can stay as well. Because um, we know what he's like. He, he could... He could pick up an injury just walking somewhere. Mm. So, yeah. So we'll see. We'll Very see glass. how it goes. And um, I think there's some in England fans and obviously the England management need to keep an eye on. Mm-hmm. And hopefully he can start performing for West Brom. Obviously the bottom of the league at the moment. Uh, so he needs to start bagging goals for them so they can obviously try and get out of trouble. There's a couple of other deals I wanted to mention, which kind of related. Um, West Ham had one outgoing, one in going. Obviously the outgoing was yeah, both are really interesting. Yeah. Uh, obviously Andre Ayew going back to Swansea, returning the club. Mm-hmm. It seemed like he didn't really want to go back. Um, yeah, it was reported on the week that he 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 considered it a step backwards in his career. Exactly, uh, yeah. which I imagine you know you would do. But I'm guessing again, as I said before on podcast, money talks. Money does talk, yeah. So obviously mm-hmm. he did make a return. I'm not. I, Reuniting with his brother for the first time since 2014. Exactly. Yeah, and it will be a shame if Swansea fans don't start singing the. Uh, yeah, yeah, and call a Tory chant with them. Yeah, the you brothers. I really hope they do because you know it'd be a shame. It, it's it's just, it'd be it's a waste. Just, waste of a signature it if they do. It would be a waste. Yeah. So, uh, um, but yeah, I think it's a good signing because when he was there, he was. I don't know what happened at West Ham really, but when he was at Swansea, he was great. Uh, he was really good. Um, he was a top player when he was at Marseille, um, and when he signed for Swansea, he continued that. Um, and you know, he deservedly got a twenty million pound move. I think it was twenty million pound move to West Ham. Um, but yeah, now going back, if Swansea want to try and continue this sort of resurgence though they're, they're on at the moment which we'll, again we'll touch on in a minute um, then yeah I think it's a great signing but yeah, the interesting thing is um, so you can touch on what you think about it in a sec but the, the interesting thing as well is obviously West Ham brought in Jordan Hugel from Preston um, as their replacement um, they also let Diafra Sacco go uh, to, I think it was to Rennes um, in France um, and it's interesting that we, you know, with Andy Carroll injured um, Javier Hernandez who also had it in a transfer request who was struggling for for um, for form it's interesting they've got rid of two strikers on deadline day and brought in someone from the championship who by all um but from from what i gather from talking to um you know people that follow championship football more than i do he hasn't been the strongest this season so what what, what are your opinions on both the iu and the uh, hugo deal very, very strange um obviously swansea haven't lost in i think over a month in the league now and uh carlos carvajal he's obviously done a great job so far which we'll, we'll continue to touch on in a bit um so it's good to see Andre go back there. Help, obviously, they help play with his brother. Um, try and get obviously get further away for survival. Uh, they signed Andy King on loan as well, which is a decent signing. Um, obviously from Leicester, Premier League winners medal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then obviously John Hugo to West Ham's a strange one. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. Very much seems with the two uh, owners, David, David Gold and David Sullivan. They kind of they have. A huge list of these strikers they always inquire for, and they always work yeah. down the list. And you just imagine that Jordan Hugo or someone at the bottom, they've gone, Oh, well, we've run out of our targets. Um, yeah. Apparently, in previous seasons, obviously, he hasn't shown anything special. Uh, this season, apparently, he's been a little bit better. He's, he's a big boy, obviously, big lad. So, he might take the prem in that. Strapping number. In, in that. In that version, in that sense. <clears throat> but as you say, the people that I know who watch Championship football, obviously, I produce some Marcus, a season ticket holder at Birmingham. So we've obviously seen him this season. Isn't impressed with him. Doesn't doesn't think he'll be able to cut cut the cloth in the Premier League. Um, says he can barely do it in the Championship. So that, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how he goes if he get a chance, and that he does. Um, obviously, he could prove everyone wrong. Thinks he won't. Um, or he could prove everyone right and obviously be awful and be another mm. bad signing by the West Ham owners. But it's it's difficult to to 
the side yet. Obviously, I haven't seen much of John Hugo myself properly. Um, obviously, I w- it'd be nice to see more of him and see what he can mm. offer to the team. But it's a strange signing for West Ham. After all the people they're linked with, you'd expect them to maybe go with that bigger, yeah. bigger name, maybe someone with a bit more pedigree. Certainly would. There's one more signing I want to touch on before we go on to managers, which I haven't actually briefed you on. But um, I've just just thought it was off my head. Do you see that Gerard De La Feu is at Watford now? <laughs> yes, I did. This is. What do you make of that deal? Because that to me is mystifying. <laughs> well, obviously he went to uh, Barcelona and uh, he did play a couple of games. And then he seemed to obviously fall out the team a little bit. Obviously he had a little injury, um, and then obviously he seemed to fall down the peck in order. Obviously so he's looking for game time. And then he obviously Watford randomly cut out of nowhere. And, just, uh, it's just mis- it's just it's so bizarre to think you know that. Um, he was at Everton at the beginning of last season and he was dreadful and he gets a six month loan to AC Milan another club that I hold near and dear um, does, does okay with Milan He's, you know he, he was alright um, and then he gets his dream switch back to Barcelona who in previous times he said he would never go back because of their mistreatment of him they promised that if he went back he would be a regular member of the first team Leo Messi supposedly didn't want him to come back because he's not seen as a high-profile player. Messi wants to play with expensive high-profile players. Um, and then obviously, not long after he goes back for a pittance, um, Barcelona sign Usman Dembele for over £100 million, same position as De La Feu. Doesn't bode well for your long-term future. No. And now he's back playing for, for Watford on loan. I just... I don't know what the point is. I brought, you know, bring this one up, but just to me, it's mystifying. I just, I think would you, his would career would you have is well. Back Everton? Um, if if he had the choice, obviously Everton and Watford, would you would you have taken back Everton? Do you know I would? If 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 we had, let's say it was a loan to a potential permanent deal, um, it's, it might be quite controversial, um, because an awful lot of Everton fans probably wouldn't have taken him back, but I would because I think he has that raw ability, and whenever he played, um in his first spell for Roberto Martinez and um, for a short while after he signed permanently he was electric and um, the, there was a game against Middlesbrough in the cup where uh, he struck up a good partnership with Lukaku and he just absolutely ruined the defence and he has that in him and I think um, I don't think he got on too well with Ronald Koeman he also struggles with uh, his attitude and his sort of how he applied himself um, but when he did apply himself and he really gave it a good go and his confidence was sky high. He was just fantastic. So I think, especially with a uh, limited pace um, and width in the squad that we've got this season, at the moment we've only got Yannick Bellassi and Theo Walcott now after letting Lennon and Morales uh, go. Um, yeah, I, I would have taken him back. I think he would have been good on a short-term loan and then, you know, see where things go. But anyway, before we'll we leave on, Everton alone. Before we move on to the manager, though, I do want to say, if you agree or disagree with any comments Cuff has made about Everton or that I've said, yeah. by the ch- either let us know in the comment section down below or tweet yeah. us at the UTF underscore podcast, or even our personal accounts, at Cuff Rights, yeah. or at... Uh, especially, um, Garvin. especially, yeah, L-W-O-S underscore Garvin. Garvin. Especially with uh, with Everton, obviously Everton and my team, um, I'm always happy to talk about Everton, so um, any any agree or disagree, disagree you know. We're always up for debate, yeah. So C-U-F-F-W-R-I-T-E-S. So yeah, just, line. just let us know either in the comments I said or on Twitter, and we'll uh, get back to you and hopefully have a nice... Dip- the bit about it. Mm. Um, obviously, on to the man just now, as we said. We spoke about Carvis Carvajal a little bit. This, I've seen a mass resurgence under him. Does this show how good a manager he is? Obviously, how maybe inept uh, Paul Clement was? Yeah, it's interesting because, obviously, he's come from Sheffield Wednesday, Sheffield Wednesday who at one point were on the verge of Premier League. But the last two years, they've obviously yeah, been they're on the, they they're on the, the verge of promotion. And, and this season, they seem to have crumbled and they're, they're slipping down the league. And I mean, yesterday, they lost to uh, Birmingham City and I mean, they haven't been great this season they've had their own problems of their um, of their own obviously so it, yeah, it's interesting how he's gone from that to a Premier League job and he's done well in the last three games he's drawn against um, who was who did they draw against at the weekend just gone um, Leicester sorry Leicester draw against there. Leicester they beat Arsenal they beat Liverpool in the last three games and they drew like, so they four, haven't they lost the um, they haven't lost since the 2nd of January when they played Tottenham so that's great. I mean, um, throughout the relegations on now as well. Yeah, Swansea so. very much looked uh, under Paul Clement, and before that, um, under they've gone through so many managers in recent years. <laughs> I can't remember who was before. Is it Francesco Guidolin or Bob Bradley? I can't. I can't remember who the one before Clement was. But th- they've gone through an awful lot of um, managers who just haven't been able to get the quality out of the players because they have an awful lot of players that have uh, quality. 
Some not so much, but they have decent players there. And I mean, Al- Alfie the Lawson, for instance, is the back. He's a great centre half. And they have um, strengthened in the trans- January transfer very well. Obviously, have, yeah. Ad- Adenayu and Andy King, obviously, especially now with obviously Leroy. They also Fur. lost Rocky Mesa back to Sevilla. Spain. That was a big deal that they made in the summer. Who he's he's a very good player in Spain. It hasn't really worked out for him the same over here. But obviously, um, with Leroy Fur now out injured as well. Obviously, Andy King could be a big yeah big, big signing yeah. for them. Um, obviously, yeah. But obviously, do you think they have enough to survive? Who are the bottom three now? Uh, West Brom. Saints. But I'm not sure. This something obviously because they won on again. I'm not sure if they managed to get out the chance. Uh, the I think it's tight at the bottom. I'm. But I think last time I checked for this weekend, I think it was like five points between ninth and relegation zone. Yeah. So it's something stupid I think, and close. Uh, unlike in recent years, for instance, when Sunderland got relegated, or when um, Wigan got relegated, or when Aston Villa got relegated, they were quite clearly the worst team in the league. Um, and they were destined to go down. Uh, I don't think there's any teams like that at the moment. There are an awful lot of teams that don't have enough quality to be in this division, but there are enough that it makes it difficult to predict who's going to go down. Um, it could quite easily be Swansea, Southampton, West Brom, Newcastle, Huddersfield, Brighton, Everton. Again, you know, it could, it could be a number of ple- a number of teams. So I think um, I think he has the tools there, and like uh, as it's proven in recent weeks, he's doing a good job. So they're on the right track but I don't certainly don't think it's over yet he'll need to keep getting the results as as the weeks go by if he's going to keep it up that's that's the biggest thing to take from the um how tight it is at the bottom that um you can win three games and be out of the relegation zone and be clear by a, a, you know a distance and think right well we've saved our season it doesn't work like that this season you have to keep going because three games later you can be sucked straight back in it so um yeah he, he has the tools but he has to keep working um yeah. but, you know talking about other other Relegation struggled um, managers. Obviously, there was a um, a bottom, uh, bottom bottom table relegation matchup. battle game, relegation yeah. battle game uh, between point, West Brom. Big six point, yeah, between West Brom and Southampton at the weekend. Obviously, Southampton come out on top, three two. Um, West Brom bottom of the table. Alan Pardew's the manager. He's under pressure. Obviously, he had a tough job when he came in this season um, to take over from Tony Pulis, who's you know someone who ordinarily you'd expect to. Keep you in the that's, Premier League, but uh, well, as you say, well, it's not a tough time, job. If it was, they could say the other way around and say Pardew got sacked in the season, Tony Pierce would be the type of guy you'd bring in. Exactly, and you'd think, and you'd, so. you'd bank on, on him uh, keeping you up. So obviously, he's got a tough, tough situation at the moment. And then Southampton's Mauricio Pellegrino has come under a lot of criticism for not getting the best out of the players he has. He's got an awful lot of money invested in his squad, um, the likes of Manolo Gabbiadini, uh, Sofia Mafal, Dusan Tadic, Nathan Red- Redmond, obviously Mario Lamina. I just bought this Guido Carrillo. He's got an awful lot of money in this squad, and they're really struggling. Um, do you think that this win for Southampton might have potentially have saved Pellegrino's job? Because, in my opinion, if he if they'd lost, I feel it might have saved his job for now. I think if they did lose, um, I think they would have been bottom of the Premier League. Uh, I think West Brom would have went above them, and I think I think they probably would have got rid then. Mm. But because they won I think he saved his job for a longer maybe till the end of the season I don't know but I feel if they do end up going down he he will be gone um, obviously yeah uh, but if, as I said there's a lot of money invested in the Southampton squad they have a lot of talent in there they've underachieved a lot this season obviously in previous seasons they've, they've been very good they're normally around ninth in the, in the league um, so it's difficult to see them obviously struggling down the bottom at the moment uh, West Brom on the other hand as I said struggle this season um, Alan Pardew is coming under more pressure now they've barely won any games under him um, you would expect them to have got a victory or something especially at home and obviously going 1-0 up as well Yeah, I had, them, thought, I, ha- I had them on my Super 6 I thought West Brom would get the result there I thought after Hagazi scored and they won 0 up at home you'd, you'd expect them to see up the game obviously Southampton played some good football came back um, obviously and won the game 3-2 especially the new sign obviously with Sturridge and our playing as well for West Brom you would expect it just a bit better from them, mm. but uh, yeah, I think it's something. Something will. Um, for now, they they're okay. They obviously need to keep pushing results. Same as you said about Swansea, uh, one winning gonna get you anyway at the moment down there, down the bottom. As, as I said, it's like five points between relegations on the ninth. It's something stupid. So, uh, you're you're unless you probably at least ten points clear, you're you're gonna be in in the, in the fight. As I said, yeah, Evan Everton, it's certainly certainly. You can just tight. get dragged into it after a couple of losses. Yeah. Um, no, I agree. Yeah, it is. It's difficult. So obviously, Pardew is now under more pressure than ever. Um, he's obviously not 
they're not like cut away yet West Brom they can still easily s- survive after if they get a couple of good results but it's, it's difficult for West Brom and they I don't see how they're going to start picking up more results when they can't beat teams like Stampton at home they're like rivals in the league at the moment so it's difficult but Pardew needs to start picking up results somewhere otherwise he could be gone as well I think it also helps uh not also helps sorry that's the wrong way to say it I think it is interesting from a neutral perspective because when you have a title race which is so one sided so easily decided yeah it's it's already a foregone conclusion it's nice to have a little bit of uh, excitement still even if it is watching the relegation the battle and seeing how it pulls the only other excitement obviously is who's going to get top four along with yeah that's so. true but I mean for a neutral I mean I know I'm not. we're not going to get top four I know you are going to get top four there's no excitement there, but you know it's it's in, at least it's interesting at the bottom thinking, uh, you know who's going to go, who's going to watching it week by week, saying who can get the results. I'm guessing you don't think you were going to go. <laughs> no, I, I worry. I did, <laughs> I, I did worry. I did worry for a couple for a couple of weeks earlier on in the season, but thankfully Sam Allardyce did get us out of a lot of uh, trouble when he first arrived. So I feel a lot more comfortable now. I still think it's a poor season, you know. By not, you know, by, don't get me wrong, it's an atrocious season, but I think we'll be okay. Um. But anyway, we have a more pressing story to talk about. Uh, if you hadn't already noticed the elephant in the room, this um, glory hunting Welshman supports the not New England hunting. Patriots. Um, it's not glory hunting. Yeah, ah, well, we, we, we shall see. The Super Bowl is tonight. So again, it'll be something else that you would have seen before we, we have seen. Um, you're obviously happy that... The Patriots. Well, but my prediction last the time obviously has ended up being correct. He said obviously we'd beat the Jaguars. It's a lot closer than I thought it would be. Um, we did win obviously with a late score. Uh, the other game was a bit more shocking really. Obviously the Vikings got absolutely destroyed by the Philadelphia Eagles. They seem to just not turn up and buckle under the pressure. Yeah, it's it's um it's strange really. Um, I I was, if anything, it was um, I was really surprised that the Jaguars gave you such a good game because at one point it was like. Patriots were done, they were out. Um, yeah, which would which would have been a massive shock. I mean, I I said last week that I was really hoping that it would be a Jaguars Vikings final, even though I knew it wasn't going to happen. Um, yeah, I think it's the most obvious way it was ever going to go. So um, obviously, like Patriots come with a fourth quarter comeback. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, I'm looking forward to it tonight. I imagine you are too. Yeah, um, the only disappointing for me thing is obviously with an Arbor State lecture in the mornings. <laughs> not going to be the best of night sleep for a few hours no after. no but no. if we win it'll be worth it staying up will be worth it if we win so. oh, well. do you, do you, are you expecting any more drama because obviously it's last g- year's was the first ever year to go to overtime um, yeah, that, was it. that was you know some drama it's so. going to be it's going to be difficult um, if you go obviously previous experience you'd obviously say the Patriots are the favourites of that way but if you're going on obviously the regular season and obviously the playoff a week score you'd go the Eagles the favourites it's really hard to to decide who's going to win. It very much, very much seems that it's a contest between form and experience. It is, and you, if, if you're going to decide on who's going to win, you've got to. You can't really. It's hard. You can't like. If I wouldn't put a bet on tonight, to be honest, because mm. I think it's just whoever turns up on the day who, who, who can deal with the pressure the best. Obviously, which maybe with the likes of Bill Belichick and Tom Brady, yeah. and obviously with the, the star studded squad you've got, they have a lot more experience of dealing with bigger cases like this. Obviously. Brady and Belichick both have five Super Bowls between them. Uh, I think um, they've played uh, played or coached in like eight different Super Bowls. So they, they're used to this big game experience, used to be able to deal with the pressure. Um, a few of the, they're used to all the chat that comes around. Exactly. Not a few of the, the other itself. Patriots players like Rob Gronkowski, who's obviously top of on. Um, it's obviously used to a big occasion. He seems to thrive under the occasion. Um a few other players, Danny Amendola. A few, a few of the boys are obviously used to playing in this big... Obviously, mm. they've been here last year or in previous years. So, you, they have more of the experience. Is it the third in a row? Uh, three in the last row. four years. Three in the last four years. I knew so, it was... Yeah. Uh, if we come in a back-to-back, obviously, it'd be great. Uh, obviously, it'd be ring number six for uh, Brady and uh, Belichick together. Which obviously there's a lot of talk. Obviously, the the combination could be coming to an end soon. Obviously, Robert Kraft. Like you know, uh, like everything has to come to an end at some point. Hopefully, uh, it's going to last a couple more years yet. But um, yeah, I'm really excited for tonight. Really interested. Uh, it's always a good contest as well. Um, as much as you know, it's not something that uh, is is taken in by the entire of this country. Um, it's it's growing and it, it it's such a big event. I mean, an awful lot of people don't like the uh, 
the um in this country specifically they don't like the the halftime performances i think it's a bit tacky it's a sporting event it's not a show but it's it's such a unique thing that you just get wrapped up in and once you watch it it's great fun it really is really interesting to watch even if you know nothing about the sport it's something you can uh really enjoy yeah so i'm, I'm looking forward to getting stuck into that obviously with an invested interest obviously myself it's even more exciting um exactly yeah i'm not sure if i'm gonna be upset or happy tomorrow morning but uh i'm hoping for the for the latter to be honest obviously i'm guessing you're i'm, hoping, I'm guessing you're going for an eagles victory just um... to spite me <laughs> do you know what I hadn't actually thought about it too much you know me but, but you know what yeah I will go for them just to spite you there's, Not no, surprised. there's no other reason I've got to support either side I, you know I, both are strong sides I don't consider either really the underdog and I like the underdog usually so I'll just you know I'll go for the Eagles to spite you the Eagles do have a British guy as well in GAG, uh, obviously the running back, so but maybe that's a little investor interest for yourself yeah why not yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll keep an eye on tonight um, what was I going to say so you're, predict- so you're predicting, obviously, the Eagles to win, or you're just hoping they're going to win? Because I'm, 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 I'm predicting and hoping Patriots going to win. I'm going to predict the Patriots win. I think the experience, um, the experience is so important, especially you know, Tom Brady is when he's at his best, he's one of the he best, the of, all, one of, the best of all time. Oh, that's debatable. He is the greatest. Of all time. Yeah, we we'll can't go that far. He is certainly up there with the best of all time. Greatest Bill Belichick is a really successful coach. He knows exactly what to do. I would, yeah. Um, I, I always think that if the Patriots get to the final, get to the final, the Super Bowl, then they have a very strong chance of uh, of winning it. Um, so yeah, I, I would be putting money on. I won't be. I don't think I'll be betting either. But if I was, my money would be on the Patriots. But you know, fingers crossed, it's not the Patriots win. Uh, um, by the time we film the next podcast, we would uh, we'll know when. Uh, certainly will. Hopefully, we'll I'll have be a quick a happy recap man. of it next time as well. Hopefully, it'll be happy. The, um, the final story we've got. It's only a bit brief one. Um, it's just uh, there's a boxing story um, that broke early early in the week. Um, Saul Alvarez or Canelo is uh, having a rematch against uh, Gennady Golovkin or Triple G. Um, obviously, they fought before. Um, both and uh, no, Golovkin was undefeated. Canelo wasn't. It was Canelo, a draw. Well, Canelo's got one loss. That was to Mayweather. So that's yeah. the only loss he has. Yeah. Um, and it ended up being a draw. Um, it was a split, split, split decision. Yeah. Um, with so I think me and myself. So that's so that, that's Golovkin's first um, failed first Victory. fight where he's failed to win. Because he's still unbeaten. Um, and now they're having the rematch. You know, how do you are you looking forward to well, it? Well, myself and many others obviously feel uh, Golovkin was basically robbed of the first fight. It was it was down as a draw, but I feel it was I feel the judges made it a draw just to be a rematch because Golovkin clearly was the winner um, so I feel that like he was robbed there obviously his perfect record has gone a little bit obviously still unbeaten though um, what shot me in the first fight was Canelo obviously has knocked out quite a few fighters with his, with his overrun right and he done that patch to Golovkin and he walked through it like it was wind in his face he really does have a chin of granite definitely and um, obviously so much power It'd be, it was an interesting quality first fight hopefully the second fight would be as interesting as good but this time it should be a clear winner um, that's hope so anyway um, I'd love to see a knockout I, I'm I'm going for and supporting Triple G because I thought he should have won the first fight mm-hmm. so I feel he, des- he deserves at least the victory in the second fight yeah I'd be thinking the same thing as much as Canelo is you know a very well respected fighter in his own right Triple G is a monster I mean I watched him against uh, Cal Brook was it two years ago um, and it I, I look, as I was saying to you off camera it's it's astounding um, with the if if he's facing up to the camera with his with his fist, how in that short distance of movement with his with his arm he can get so much power. It's it's it really is amazing because he doesn't look he's not a massively built man, um, but he's so powerful, so strong, and like we said, he can take he can take blows like any man. So um yeah, I, I think he is one of the best boxers going at the moment. Um, and I think that, do you think that does have Canelo does have in his favour is obviously GGG is getting older. So um, that could maybe come to an effect. It doesn't seem to affect him yet. This obviously in his career, but we never know when when age does it do. It's quite hard. So we'll see what we'll see what happens in the fight. Obviously, either yeah. of them could win. You never know what's going. Especially when t- there's two high quality superstars like them two are. It's always it's at the very least you know it'll be entertaining, or at least you hope it'll be entertaining up, because um, uh, like you say, when you, have, when you have two, when you have two 
high profile fighters together. It's always entertaining. Yeah, styles are quite interesting and intense mm. to watch anyway. Obviously they both love a knockout, just which clear in their records. Mm-hmm. They both can punch hard, they both can take a punch. So it's, it's always interesting to watch. Um obviously as I said, the only thing that's in Canelo's favour is obviously GGG is aging and obviously Golovkin would probably be slight favourite. Uh be, it'd be interesting to watch and I, I, I hope Golovkin can pull out the victory this time and I hope there's no controversy controversy as it normally is with boxing. Yeah, I think um it always spoils the contest, even if, you know, Golovkin is um astounding if, if he ends up winning it over controversial decision. Um it, it's just it leaves a sour note. You don't want you don't want fighters to you don't want fights to go down as being um questionable or or controversial. You want them to be remembered as that was amazing. That that fighter was fantastic and that. Um Basically, you want a great fight and a clear winner, and that'll be the best situation for all. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's it. You want it to be the most entertaining um, event that it can be for the fans, um, and also you want it to be a, a clear winner either way. Unless it genuinely is a draw, in which case, yeah, call it correctly. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, May the 5th, last fight's happening, so make sure everyone keeps an eye on hopefully watches that. Um, I have nothing else to say. I don't know about you. Well, I think that's done. If you want to round us up. Again, uh, just a just really quick notice. We are, like, like we said earlier... <laughs> We are going to be back um, slightly earlier this week, Friday or Saturday, one of the days of the weekend, because we're filming on Thursday. Um, and again, thanks for all the support. Thanks to Marcus for everything he does. Um, thanks for you for being a co-host. Yeah, cheers. Absolutely. You want to send um, us off? Yeah, obviously, hopefully you keep supporting us. And like I said, let us know if you want, if you've got anything to say to everything Cuff said or I've said. Obviously, we're always up for a debate. Let us know in the comment section down below or on Twitter or Facebook. Um, all our links are in the description. Like, subscribe, and we'll see you next week.